Currently on in the markets, the S&P is down about a point and a half as we record at uh, a little after 1 p.m. in the afternoon on Tuesday. And uh, of most significance, we're going to talk about today is one of the signals that just showed up in the market that's potentially rather important for the short term. Uh, so we'll get to that when we actually look at the S&P itself. But uh, today we're going to look at the uh, the macro sectors like we do relative to the S&P and how we start off each week. We're also going to look at the 11 macro sectors chart by chart. And it's only a few weeks ago that we did this, but because the market keeps making new all-time highs, it's important to look at the 11 sectors and see which ones are making new highs, which ones aren't, and kind of how they each look, because that'll give you a better feel to how the whole underlying uh, perception of the market is from, from uh, the investment community. Is it all coming into the growth parts? Is it coming into defensive sectors, et cetera? Uh, so we'll dig deep into each one of the 11 charts today. And uh, as a reminder, I mentioned last week, this Friday, November 22nd, I will be on Fox Business TV sometime between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern time with host Charles Payne. So catch me on that if you have the chance. Let's start off here just looking at what's going on sector by sector relative to its performance uh, last week. Uh, these are all year to date. So on the right hand side, it's through last night's close. Um, each vertical bar is telling you how that sector is done versus the S&P since uh, December 31st of last year. And the slide on the left is the same slide, but just uh, the slide we used last week. So we're looking at what changes have occurred in the past week. And we highlight those with either red dots for those that have fallen over 1% in relative performance since last week, or green dots for those that have increased by 1% or more. So uh, industrials in that bright cyan are up 4.74%, but they were up 582 last week. So that has taken a hit of over 1%. Materials have gotten deeper into the underperformance area from what was minus 2.39, now over three and a half uh, percentage points of underperformance. Also in this business, we would say that's the, another way of saying that is 350 basis points of underperformance. Uh, energy continues to be the worst sector and kind of got rocked last week for a good um, 3% or so. Uh, last week we see it was only down 15.14%. It is now down 18.33%. So about uh, almost 320 basis points in a single week uh, getting really hit hard and pushing itself right back near the lows of the year in relative terms. Uh, healthcare actually gained on the week. You'll see last week it was minus 12.29. This week it's only 10 point, uh, down 10.9, so it actually increased about 1.3%. Um, so a good week for healthcare. Um, utilities were down 4.47. They're now only down 2.75, so you saw it be back in somewhat of uh, what we typically would call a defensive sector as interest rates uh, fell last week. Um, you're, you're seeing a bid back into utilities, which are typically high yielding and they are competition for the bond market. So, um, you'll, that, that's a very common thing to see is when yields fall, utilities get bid for, um, financials fell over 1%. They were up 3.7. Also, same type thing. Interest rates fell last week. So that affects the financials and people took profits on those. They're only up two and a half percent or so. And then again, in real estate, um, they were only up 145 basis points above the S&P. They're now up 305. And that also is an interest rate sensitive market. So as yields came off, real estate, which tends to kick off returns, um, do better when yields fall. So you're seeing the, you know, decent sector movement and, uh, the, the, the reason we look at this on such a consistent basis also is because portfolio managers who are benchmarked to the S&P, so let's take your classic long-only uh, mutual fund that the portfolio manager is trying to do at least as well as the S&P. Very few of them actually can do it over the course of the year. 
and very uh, far less can do it over the course of several years. But um, their game is different than other people's game. Uh, and it's important that you make sure you understand this because as you play the markets, you need to know what is the incentive behind why people do what they do. So whereas most of us trade the market and our intent is simply to make money in the market, that's not the goal of somebody who's running a mutual fund that's benchmarked to the S&P. They want to do just as well, if not better than the S&P. And the way uh, that they can do that is to overweight those sectors that they think are going to outperform and underweight those that they think are going to underperform. Because in theory, they're invested 100% of the time with virtually 100% of the capital they have. They can raise a little bit of cash if they get bearish the market, but generally, they're not paid not to be fully invested. They are paid to be fully invested in the market uh, with the goal of outperforming the market. And uh, so if, if somebody gave $1,000 to a mutual fund, you'd expect that $1,000 to be invested all the time. And for long-term growth, you want that money invested all the time. But on a year-by-year -year basis, that portfolio manager is going to be judged based upon how they do relative to the S&P, if that's what their benchmark is. If it's, a, if it's a small cap mutual fund, then they're probably going to be benchmarked to the Russell 2000. But by and large, the S&P 500 is what more mutual fund portfolio managers are benchmarked to than anything else. So it's really important to understand when and why they're shifting from one sector to another because their intent in, in shifting sectors is to find those that are going to do better than the S&P. Um, so you can see that something like energy, you know, if we looked at this even back in February, energy was going to be down and underperforming. It's been down all year. Technology has outperformed all year. Those are the big uh, barbell sectors, the ones on the, the farthest end of sector performance. The ones closer to the zero line, um, you can still see there's one, two, three, four, there's five outperformers and uh, six underperformers. Uh, and the goal, again, is to find the ones that are going to do best over time. They don't like to shift frequently, so they may only shift a couple times a year at most. And that's that's their game. That's their way of playing the market. So. When we see something like energy fall over 300 basis points in a single week, um, that's more people selling a sector that's already down and underperforming. And as we have only, uh, I don't know what, six weeks or so to go um, into year's end, that's a sector that's gonna most likely stay depressed because there's little chance that barring huge fundamental shift, in the thinking of how energy is going to go between now and year's end, um, people are going to look to stay out of that and underinvested in that sector and possibly even just dump names they have in it before year is up. Um, and that's why you're seeing, you know, a move of 300 percent. I'm sorry. Yeah, three, three full percent, um, 300 basis points in, in the energy sector last week. And so. You know, we're going to, we, we continually monitor this. We talk about it every week. And if I dedicate this much time um, each show to it, it, it's rather important that you get a sense of it. And in fact, that's why we're going to even spend more time in the balance of the show uh, going into each one of the 11 sectors. Just quickly before we get to the charts, to contact me, it's rick at inthenotrader.com. Uh, our website, same thing, www.inthenotrader.com has lots of information and videos that you're going to find interesting um, about psychology and trading, models that we use, et cetera, TV appearances that I have, as well as information on how you can sign up to become a subscriber to it. So this, even though every week I give you some very valuable information in this free podcast, uh, clients are getting much more tactical, uh, specific trade recommendations in ETFs, and uh, a whole lot more than obviously we do on the podcast each week. So 
Let's now take a look and flip to our charts. And the most important chart to start off, uh, we always look at the S&P 500 and what uh, you, you can't help but notice the yellow circled area, uh, which is a 13 count, which showed up today. So the S&P has a sequential 13 count this morning, suggesting upside exhaustion to this near term move. Doesn't mean it has to sell off materially. It just says right here and right now, you're likely better off not being a buyer uh, in this uptrend. And that uh, decent chances are you'll have a better chance and uh, to buy the market at a lower price than, than where we are today. Number two is notice the horizontal lines, and I'll, I'll show you here with my arrow. This was at 31.22. This is an equal legs move up from the bottom. So what I basically did is took the important June low and I measured the height of the rally. So I found the highest high here and took that same distance and added it to the low in August. So in other words, equal heights of moves measured to 31.22. We hit that today. Unrelated to that is something is a model, another uh, model, this one that Tom DeMarc developed, which you'll see with this pink line. And there's another level up here. That's measured off of the August low and it measures increments of 5.56% called trend factors. So I have a trend factor at 3136. It's only 14 S&P points away from equal legs up. So I already know that there's potential resistance here, and we've, we've mentioned this in our note for a few months now, that 3122 to 3136 is uh, our next target up. Unrelated to that, we get the sequential upside exhaustion signal this morning that falls into that same range. We'd never know at the time that we put out this 14-point target range that we'd also happen to get a 13 at the same time. So now I have unrelated models, three different ways of looking at the market that are all suggesting that right here and right now, you probably don't wanna be a buyer. So despite the fact that the market's moving higher, and I think it likely is still higher than here by year's end, the immediate move from right now to me doesn't make sense to be a buyer. It makes more sense to either do nothing or even take a little profits, or as I've said to institutional clients, if you're looking to buy some downside protection, especially with a VIX that's relatively low price right now at 12.67, uh, um, this is probably a good time and place to buy some downside protection that's relatively cheap in the scheme of things because the VIX is fairly low priced. Um, so for those of you who are looking to protect your portfolios and um, Look for times and places that, that not only is volatility cheap to buy that protection, but from a place that the market may very well stall from, this is the time and place as far as I'm concerned for, for what could be um, a pullback. And do I expect much of a pullback? I don't. An initial downside target would be about 50 points lower at uh, 3071 or so. Uh, that's where this level is here. Uh, I'd say worst case between now and year's end, you got to 3015. Um, but I don't, I do not see it getting worse than that. Um, so, so that's the way I kind of play here defensive, uh, for now and, um, look for a minor pullback that, that for those of you who are tactical traders, this is the time and place to, to likely put that, that play on. All right. So that's the S and P. Um, now. Let's take a look at, um, where's my, hold on a sec. I'm gonna switch to, you're here somewhere, here we go, macro sector ETFs. Okay, so let's go through the 11 sectors and see what they show. We're gonna default to weekly charts and all of these will be weekly charts unless we say otherwise. Um, so we start off and we, we just go through them alphabetically based on, they all start with XL. Uh, so the 11 macro sectors all, all start with the ticker XL. XLB is the first one alphabetically, that's the material sector. Um, and what's interesting is that we have a weekly 13 in place. You can see here from last week. 
So that's also saying potential upside exhaustion. It's doing so up against a propulsion resistance level at 60.99. And the high of this whole move so far is 60.80. This week's high is even lower at 60.47, and we're currently trading 60.13. So this is saying that materials right here, right now, also probably um, are in a buy. I'd wait for, if, if you still think everything's going to go higher uh, and, and you're a bull, then you wait for a pullback here because this would indicate that for right here, right now, there's a chance that we pull back. And, and of course, because the S&P itself is on a daily um, sequential 13 count, the fact that we have a weekly one here in materials, now you have two time frames that are saying the market and the sector may very well pause. So um, again, I'm not going to go chase after this. You can see also there's... Uh, Let's see here, if we just put up a trend line, something in around this level is old highs anyway. So other than the all-time highs that were made in early 2019, this really is a significant resistance level um, in materials and therefore not a name that I want to go after right here, right now. Let's go to XLC, which is communication services. So obviously this uh, got put into the S&P rejiggered things last year, so we don't have a lot of trading history. Uh, so all we have is this to work with. We saw the 13s earlier in the summer, both aggressive sequential and standard sequential. Uh, sequential aggressive is in deep purple, the standard settings are in red. We got a pullback from there. We've turned around and actually pushed, so we are on all-time highs right now. Um, this it's, it's, I don't, I don't have it as a clean breakout yet, even though it has made new highs, but, um, it's, I, I'm kind of here. If we draw the line here, you can see we're very much kind of trading on what was the all time high at the time. Uh, on the upside, this would project as high as 54 and a quarter or so. Two different lines unrelated to each other both show up there. One is the stop out from the 13. And I see underneath there's also a propulsion target there. Um, so on an up move, you, you get another couple dollars worth, which is, I don't know, about 4% or so um, in, in percentage terms. On the downside, if I'm looking to be a buyer, I'd probably look somewhere near 50 and a half-ish, give or take, if that opportunity came. Uh, what I wouldn't want to see is for us to likely get below the low of uh, 49.53 from the middle of October. Um, so let me just see this 49.76. And yeah, so probably something right around 49 and a half. Um, getting under there would, would, would concern me. And it would certainly say that this breakout was, was not anything material at all. Um, after XLC comes XLE. So let's move on to, oops. Yeah, yeah we are. All right, energy. So this we know is in the dog. So we have somewhat equal lows versus the 2016 lows, right? So late the Christmas low last year held right above the 2016 low. This year's lows have held above it. Plus this year's lows was marked with 13. Um, so the good news is there is some evidence to suggest that this is in a basing period um, and, and that given how much this, here, let me take the cloud away. I think it's probably not going to help right now. So um, given the, the move that we've seen over time here, um, it does mean we have to stop, but you start getting some sense that this can base. The thing is, there's plenty of room in which this can base, because if you look at where the sequential 13 came in, which nailed the low of the year, the stop out level for that, in other words, where the model would say it's wrong that there's downside exhaustion here, is all the way down at 48.70, down here, which means we can certainly test and, and possibly even exceed the 2016 low to the downside and still be in a basing pattern. 
Uh, so this is not broken out to the upside if we draw a trend line. I don't, let's see. Yeah, actually it did break. Uh, so then we had to redraw it. Okay, so we, we have had some minor upside breakouts, but nothing significant yet. And you'll notice that uh, the upside breakout we did get here on this price bar stopped right at the propulsion level, came right back down. So I'm, this is the type of thing where energy, if you're a long-term investor, you use weakness in this area to do some bidding. And anywhere from here down $10, so we're talking you know, in percentage terms, almost 20% lower from here. So you've got a, there's no rush to do this. And um, if you think this sector is a place you wanna be in over time, then use any subsequent weakness to bid and realize this, this is gonna end up most likely needing to be a long-term hold. Um, things would have to materially change within the fundamentals of the sector, which right now obviously aren't all that great. Uh, oil stays kind of stuck in the 50s. Uh, you know, it's over a year since I was on Bloomberg TV and had said that the high at $77 last October in oil was going to be the high for the whole move. And people gave me a lot of uh, negative feedback about that and said oil was going to 80, 90, $100. And that $77 high has been the high for over a year, got down to 42 and a half, um, rallied to 66, and has been kind of sitting in the 50s and even the last couple of days oil's come off a few dollars and uh, is now around 55 40 or so for the January contract. Um, so again if I look at the energy sector simply by itself I'd say you can do some bidding but you know don't be surprised if if it trades off more and uh, in order to really probably get an upside breakout. I'd want to get above, I'd say probably 64-ish, give or take, and then stay above 64 to give it any chance that it can come back to the mid to upper 70s and kind of just play in this big range that it's been in over the last couple of, weeks, uh, last couple of years. All right, let's look at financials. So, Financials are trying to break out. January of 2018 were the all-time highs. It was accompanied by a 13 at the time. We had an aggressive 13 in the summer, which was a good sell-off and good signal. Now we have another one up against all-time highs. So you, you can see there's resistance from the original 13, which is these long, this long row of red dots. We're at a propulsion target here that for the last three weeks have captured the highs. Um, and let me see the 13 that got put in last week. I'm trying to see where actually it wasn't last week. It was a few weeks ago and we're just, it's kind of hidden here. Let me see if I can stretch this out, get where those dots are. 29.83 and we're trading at 29.90. Um, so this is close to getting an upside breakout. I ideally want to see it really get above 30.11 or so and then stay above there. Um, and that's only going to happen, in my view, if rates can start moving back up. As long as rates stay under pressure, and uh, today the 10-year is at uh, 1.78, and it's down 2.5 basis points on the day, uh, financials are going to have a hard time to really break out to the upside. Um, so. If they can break out, it likely is accompanied by a move back up in yields um, or the anticipation that yields are going to move higher and that they're not going to go significantly lower. So um, based on DeMarc modeling right here, right now, you'd still say that there's somewhat higher than normal risk to first buying. Where would I like to get long the XLF on a pullback? I'd say something near 28 and a quarter, 28 would make me feel more comfortable. You know, somewhere down in here probably makes me feel more comfortable than, than chasing after um, up here. Now, I've been personally, I've been along these for years. Uh, so I've, I've, you know, withstood even the lousy um, sell off that we had last year into the Christmas bottom. But, you know, to me, financials are always a part of the market that I want to have exposure in. So for long term holders, uh, this is certainly a hold and, and potentially a, a new buy again soon. But for right here, right now, I hold off again. Weekly 13, we're in the context of a weekly 13. At the same time, we have that daily 13. 
Let's move on to, oops, I skipped one here. So funny. Uh, my mouse disappears when I click into some of these things. So a little harder to find it. Um, here's industrials. And I'm going to try to stretch this out a bit. If it's going to, let's see, do I have any cooperation? No. There we go. Okay. Slew of 13s, uh, all kind of good when they show up. This one good for a month, this one good for almost two months. Uh, we're bucking up against this, uh, the buy stop against this 13. So that hasn't uh, broken out through yet. This 13 is still active here in the sense of uh, we, we really need to get above 84 to get a clean breakout to the upside to then target 91. On the downside, again, if notice, the propulsion levels held as support down here. It broke underneath, but not properly. Broke under here, not properly. The next level up is 77.22. So we get down here, same thing. On a pullback, I'm a buyer in the 78 handle. I'm sorry, the 77 handle. Uh, so if we get a pullback from here, as we might very well, um, we buy, and again, above 84 can, can get me to buy more. Uh, now let's get to technology. Making all-time highs uh, as we speak, right up against the propulsion level, so as a target. So same thing, probably I, I wouldn't mind waiting for a pullback and because I think one might come in the market anyway over the next week, week and a half. Uh, you can probably get this a little lower. I don't know if we can get as low as 83 from the current 87.70. Uh, but if this can break out to the upside, next target is up just over 100. So. Definitely want to, you know, technology has been the star and it continues to be the star. Consumer staples, interesting, also making highs. Um, so that even though this is a defensive sector, so this week makes all time highs. It is within the context of about eight, 10 weeks ago, a 13 signal. There is some resistance right overhead. Uh, I much rather see us get above 62, uh, 90, so 63 ish. Uh, before being a buyer, we're also on a sequential 12 count here. Um, so same thing, rather be a buyer and a pullback. If we get a chance at 59, uh, happier to, to buy it there. Uh, REITs have had trouble recently. We've seen the 13s go to the stop level, break down from there. Um, this is a sector that's also kind of in question right now. Um, a bigger sell-off is potentially at hand if, if we can't take out uh, the high from two weeks ago. So I'd watch that. Utilities peaked on a nine count. Again, uh, they've come off recently. Um, there is some support. Uh, let's see, this is bar six, six. I'd like to see if, in the, if we continue the down count in the next uh, couple of weeks. So right now we have a six down. That means that it's uh, six weeks in a row that the Friday close or the current close is less than the close from four Fridays prior. Uh, so keep an eye on this and depending upon where this closes on Friday uh, will help determine if, if this count stays in place and we close under the close from four weeks ago, I stay uh, kind of negative on that. Uh, we've got just a few seconds less. Healthcare making new all-time highs. We wanted uh, also a troubled sector this year but um, is pushing new highs. You see it is running up against resistance. So I don't want to be a buyer right here, right now. And lastly, as we finish up is consumer discretionary. Uh, these made new highs several months ago, accompanied with weekly 13s. Uh, these are holds. If I get uh, consecutive Friday closes underneath 117, then I think it can come off more. Otherwise, I stay with this and, and look for it to kind of move with the market. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. I am Rick Bensignore, and this is In the Note Trader.